All right, let's turn to scripture here. We're going to be opening to 1 Thessalonians 5. This is the last message in the series, and I get to do it. So 1 Thessalonians 5 will be in uh, verse 12 through 28. Let's take a moment to pray real quick. Father, as we get, open your word, I just pray that you will allow our hearts to be bent towards you, allowing us to worship you through listening to your word and reading it. And God, I just pray that you will use my words in a way that I know that I wouldn't normally be able to speak. And so God, um, use this time greatly. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so in June of 2014, I... Uh, before that, I worked for a decade up in Michigan. I was a youth and music pastor. And then June of 2014, we decided to make our way down to Florida because of uh, we had a new senior pastor come in. And so I was leaving um, at, at his request. And so there was some struggles that were happening. And, and so June of 2014, we decided to come to Florida. And it took us two months to come down. We would stop off at friends' and family's houses, and we would stay for weeks to three weeks at a time, and we just enjoyed our traveling coming down here. And then in August of 2014, August 1st of 2014, by the way, the worst time to come to Florida with humidity. You feel like you're literally swimming in the air. And, and uh, so August of 2014, we ended up moving into my parents' house. My family at that time had four children, my wife, and myself, so six of us. At that same time, my sister, Helen, and her husband and her four kids also moved from Pennsylvania into my parents' house. So there was 14 of us and in a three-bedroom, two-and-a-half-bath house. It was a little tight. So what we had to do as the Rices is we had to sit down at every place we were at, especially our parents' house, and go through a list of rules that we needed our children to abide by for there to be peace within my parents' house. Some of the rules, like make sure that you respect what mom and pop up say. When they say don't do something, don't do it. When they say do something, do, do it. And make sure that when you're walking around, have at least some clothes on. Don't jump on the furniture. Don't throw balls in the house. When you're inside, use your inside voice. When you're outside, use your inside voice. You know, like all of these rules for us to be able to live peaceably with my parents and their neighbors because there were so many of us. And that is actually what Paul is doing here in First Thessalonians as he's signing off this letter. He is taking some time to walk through who he considers to be his family because in the New Testament, uh, the church is considered to be family. And, and the concept is seen when Paul uses the words brother so often. And so he's going through with these list of do's and don'ts, but it's not just a list of do's and don'ts. It's actually uh, a way for uh, us to understand gospel life and gospel community. And so today's message, I actually entitled How to Live in Gospel Community. And so from here on out, we are going to learn, church, how to live in gospel community according to Paul. We're gonna take some time to look at three specific ways that he has labeled out. And so I've divided this into certain ways, uh, certain sections, and we are going to really go from step to step, verse to verse, uh, just because Paul laid it out so beautifully. And so the first way that he wants us to live in gospel community is through respect. The second way, love. And the third is worship. So let's take a moment to read 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 12 and 13. It says, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among you. So the first thing that Paul is talking about is respect. He's saying you need to respect those that God has placed over you in verse 12. And he's really talking to the congregation in relationship to the leaders. And so he's talking to the church of Thessalonica saying, we have placed people in position over you. You need to respect them because this is something that, that I find important and also God finds important. And God has utilized me through the Holy Spirit to put them into position. 
And so in the Bible, we are called to respect all over the place, right? Kids, you're supposed to respect and honor your parents. Wives, you're called to respect your husbands. We are to respect those in political authority over us. And here in this verse, we are to respect those that God has placed in leadership of, of churches, specifically the church that, is, that we are part of. Now, one thing that you have to understand is pastors have to follow a certain criteria that is found in First, Thess- uh, First Timothy and Titus. When you read that, there is a list of things that a pastor has to measure up to. And so pastor and elders are not supposed to have their hand, have hands laid on them quickly, but in turn, they're supposed to be discernment. But they are gonna be vetted and put into place by God-fearing, God-loving people. People who know the word of God, people that love God and are empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so elders are not just anyone. They are people whom God has called to be in that position. So if you look in the Bible, Paul describes these leaders in three different ways. And I'm just going to divide verse 12 up. The first way that Paul describes Christian leaders is that they labor among you. The word labor, it's a word that's used for toil. It's kind of a farming term. So I, I don't know about you, but uh, I grew up in the country uh, in Pennsylvania. There was 200 people there, and there was a lot more cows than there were people. And so I grew up doing four-wheeling and, and uh, enjoying the, the outside all of the time. I really never played on a game console growing up. So now, uh, being older and trying to play game consoles with my children, it's horrendous because they're destroying me all over the place with Mario. Um, but I would actually, I had a couple jobs when I was in the country. I did masonry. I was a mason labor. I worked in the kitchen at a camp. And, and so I was used to hard labor. And then I went and worked on a farm. And I would take care of the animals that were on the farm. And I would help take care of the equipment that was going to actually do the farming. And when you look at what a farmer does, a farmer, they get and they prepare the land, they sow the seed, and then they reap it. And then they have to process that, but they have to take care of the equipment that, that is there. They have to take care of all the, of the animals that they have on their, their farm. And there's so much work. And so I would get up, I'd be there around seven o'clock and I'd work a full day. But by the time I was there at seven o'clock, the farmer has already been up doing a ton of stuff. And then I would leave and they were still working. And so there was a sense that Paul is saying that, that the leaders, they actually labor over you. And so you're like thinking, what does a pastor do that labors, right? Well, let me name some things. Uh, preparing sermons, preaching and teaching the word, visiting the sick, counseling, instructing, marrying and burying. And, and I, I list these things and you're like, well, that doesn't so- sound too laborious, right? But let me, let me uh, flower that out a little bit. Preparing sermons. The average pastor takes about 10 to 18 hours to prepare their sermon. So when they stand up here for 30 to 45 minutes, it's not like they've just opened scripture and said, I'm just going to give you uh, just what I'm thinking. Like they are praying, they are preparing, and they're allowing the Holy Spirit to work in their life. And they want to listen so that they can share what God has for you. So uh, they take a lot of time of preparation. And then preaching and teaching the word, there is a weight that comes to make sure that we are, are being very careful in our ha- handling of the word. Because when we preach the word, it's very easy. Galatians says, if I or angels preach a different gospel, then we should be accursed. And it's actually not even a gospel. And so like, if I give you something or preach something that is of my opinion and it doesn't line up with scripture, then I am accursed. I'm, I have the problem. And so there is a way of preaching and making sure that the word of God lands appropriately as the Holy Spirit works through us as we speak. Visiting the sick, it's entering times with people when they are vulnerable. It is the hardest times for people. It's oftentimes when they become very honest, especially when they're very sick. And so then they start walking through a lot of things that they've been holding behind or, or holding on to or struggling with. Counseling, it's carrying burdens and having emotional weights with those that we serve. 
Uh, I mean, conversations behind closed doors are not usually the fun, light conversations. They come with problems and things that they are struggling with. And we have to make sure that we know Scripture enough to be able to direct them appropriately to the Word of God, whether it's commands or principles. Instructing, it's appropriately directing people biblically. So these, these are the more um, uh, lighter conversations, but I have people that are like, hey, should I take this job? And I'm like, well, you know, first opinions says, you know, and, and like, uh, but, but like I can point to, well, are you able to be a good steward? And, and other principles that scripture has, but we have to make sure that we are guiding people appropriately because can you imagine if we're guiding wrongly, them coming back and being very happy with us? Um, marrying, we get to walk through a process. I usually spend anywhere between, between 10 to 20 hours with couples before they get married. Uh, Jeff, uh, a singer, actually just married someone this weekend, uh, and, and he spent all of his time in premarital counseling, and he came back to me, and he was like, it was amazing to walk life with them and hear them and help them through struggles and to share how God has worked in our lives and, and just to be able to do that with them. And, then, and I get to do that. As, as a pastor, I get to, to walk through that and marry people. And then bearing, you enter people's grief. It's a hard time when people lose people. I just called someone uh, this weekend that uh, he was with his dad for two weeks and then left. And pretty soon after he left, his dad died. And so he was grieving. And he was about to walk into a funeral right before I called uh, over in Virginia. And that's grief. And we get to walk that with them and help them and allow the, the spirit to, to wash over them and support them. And so it's more than physical laboring. It's em emotional and mental laboring. And Paul is trying to indicate to the Christians at Thessalonica that pastoral ministry is hard work. Now, you may look at me and be like, well, you're definitely preaching to us on how to treat you. Well, <laughs> I am a pastor, but I fall underneath a lot of other men, elders and pastors here at the church. And so I'm required to do this with them also. So I'm not just preaching to you, I'm preaching to myself. So I looked up some statistics of why pastors quit. Uh, I came across uh, a couple of these uh, of why people burn out, pastors burn out, or what causes them to quit. So I wanted to kind of walk through this. I, th I found it kind of interesting. Uh, a lot of them, um, I can see them, not necessarily resonate, but 84% uh, of pastors feel as though they are on call 24-7. They don't have good boundaries, and so their phone and, and their, their door is always open. They don't ever get to have that sabbatical, that rest. 80% uh, uh, believe that pastoral ministry has negatively affected their families. Many pastors' uh, children do not even attend church now because of what the church has done to their parents. I can see that. 90% of pastors report the ministry was completely different than they thought it would be before they entered the ministry. I, I see that. I was like, it's gonna be fun walking with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I love you all. I really do. It's hard. It's different. Uh, it's even, there was a statistic that said the seminary didn't even prepare pastors for ministry. And I, I'm I mean, I love seminaries. I went to seminary, I have my, my master's, but they, they are all dealt with theology and doctrine and not application. Uh, so there, that needs to change in this, in this country. 57% of pastors um, are not even able to pay their bills. 53% of pastors are concerned about the future family, uh, the future of their family's financial security. 80% of pastors expect conflict within their church. That's a sad statistic. 70% of pastors report that they have a lower self-image now than when they first started. 84% of pastors desire to have close fellowship with someone that they can trust and confide with, but they don't have. They feel on an island. You ready for this? The profession of pastor is near the bottom of a survey of the most respected professions, just above car salesmen. So it is, it is a grind, and Paul is saying this. 
Like respect them because they labor. And he's saying respect them because he knows that pastors are not often respected. And so Paul, he is encouraging them to respect and care for the people who have been placed into leadership. The second way that Paul describes Christian leaders is that they are over you, found in verse 12. When we read that, it's easy to think of pastors as being over you and defining that as those who have control and power. And a lot of times when people read that passage, they read it, um, they read it that they are, they are to rule over you in the Lord. And that's not what it's talking about. It doesn't have the word rule. And so unfortunately, there are pastors and elders who are, who are um, tempted to lead that way. That, that are easy to have this, this authority and to feel this authority and then they end up abusing their positions and they can abuse it in, in financial ways, in sexual indiscretions, in emotional abuse. And unfortunately, I think as I said this, many of you probably had big name pastors that have entered your mind that you are aware of that have lost their ministry because of this. And unfortunately, some of you may even have people that have entered your mind that have directly affected you. And that may be why you are here at Building 28. The word used for over you, it conveys a notion of authorita- uh, authorita- author- presiding, thank you, <laughs> presiding and leading and directing with authority. There you go. And Paul uses this four times, okay? In 1 Timothy, as he instructs Timothy about the character uh, and the duties of the church elders. We see this uh, in, in 1 Peter 1 through 3, when he calls pastors to actually be under shepherds for the chief shepherd. He says, so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. So pastors are not supposed to have that control and force you into doing things that you, you are supposed to be doing, but instead they're supposed to be examples that are moving you and showing you what you're supposed to be doing. So exercising oversight is enacting a covering of protection. Just as a shepherd stays awake to watch over the flock or to make sure that none of the, sh- the sheep stray away, spiritual shepherds, through the power of the Holy Spirit, are to protect spiritually, bring functioning unity, direct in life's difficulties and direct change when needed to keep the health of the church. And this calling of leadership is servant leadership. When I went to Northland, that is what they ingrained into our minds is that you are not just a leader, you are a servant leader. And when we graduated, they gave us a, a, a towel for foot washing as an example of what we are supposed to do as pastors, and I really appreciate that. We are no greater than our master. We see before the feast of Passover, before Jesus was betrayed, he washed the disciples' feet, uh, and we see in John 13, 12 through uh, 17, it says, "When, when he had washed their feet and put on their outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do so just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is no greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who has sent him. If you know these things, Blessed are you if you do them. And so then we see at the end of verse 12 that this is done in the Lord. True shepherds are not self-appointed. Instead, they are equipped and appointed by God. 
2 Corinthians 3, 5 through 6 says, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. We are not here to hit the Bible over your head. We are here to preach it to you, to speak it to you, to teach it to you, and then allow the Holy Spirit to work. It is nothing that we do. It is only through the sufficiency of God. And the third way that Paul describes Christian leaders is the ones who admonish. And this is a little bit more difficult, people. The, the Christian life is an ethical life. The Christian leaders are charged with the responsibility of instructing believers in the way that they should walk in the areas of conduct. And this can happen from preaching the word from the stage or it can happen individually as we talk. And it is unfortunately difficult when we start dealing with sinful situations and people who are not willing to repent because then we have to move into Matthew 18, which is church discipline. And that's a reality of a church. And it's not meant for punishment. It's meant to cause them to come into repentance. So Paul, he wraps up this portion of verse 13 and says, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Believe, be, um, believers are not to exalt pastors. They are not to despise pastors. Instead, they're supposed to offer respect and esteem because of the work that they're doing. And then the last per, part of verse 13 says, be at peace among yourselves. When I read that, I was like, well, that's kind of easy to do. But when you put it in context, he's talking to people about how they're supposed to deal with leaders. And very easy, all too often, it's easy for the congregation or the people who come into a church to look at the leaders, the elders, the deacons, those who are moving forward, the church who have been placed in that position to think that they can make better decisions or do things better or preach better, or say things better, and then they have a better skill. And very possibly, you might ha have gifts that we don't have. But God has placed us, leaders, elders, into the position that we are in to use the gifts that he has given us. And so when, you, when you, we catch that as a church, it changes the way that we may interact with the pastor's and elders, and it says, live peaceably among yourself. So it doesn't mean don't disagree. If you have a disagreement, come talk. Have an opinion. It's, it's not a, a binding order to not say anything. But if you do so, do peaceably. Do with love for the church, and love for your brothers, and love for your leaders with respect. In the second, so I know, excuse me, I know that there are some things that are done and decided differently than you might realize, but it is important that you consciously make that effort to be respectful and loving and caring and want the best for the church. So the second way to live on gospel community um, is to love those that are around you. When you read this, I don't know, verse 14, it says, um, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient with them all. Whenever I've read this or heard it preached, it's like, Christian, this is what you're supposed to do individually. But when you put it within context, this, Paul is talking to the congregation individually to deal with one another. And so he's saying, love those around you. This is what we as a congregation are supposed to do to one another. And then what we do as a congregation flows out to individually. And so Paul is now turning his attention to the congregation by saying brothers. He's encouraging the church with these responsibilities, these three things. Uh, and, but, but first of all, before we walk into it, he, he talks about uh, the three groups of people that Paul is describing here. The first group is idle. We are to admonish the idol. When we think of idol, we think lazy, right? It's defined differently here. It's actually defined as disorderly or disruptive or out of order. 
Second uh, Thessalonians 3.11, Paul calls them busybodies. He says, for we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busybodies. And these Christians, they will disrupt the peace at the church, often through their sinfulness. And they must be warned for the benefit of the whole body. So they can do this by backbiting, by gossiping, troublemaking, even sinfully living in a, in a blatant way. And the second group found in verse 14, we urge you brothers to admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, um, it, it, it is, is the faint-hearted, excuse me. The second group is the faint-hearted. We are to encourage the faint-hearted. Beale states that the faint-hearted literally means small of soul or discouraged. For Thessalonica, this could be because of the persecutions that they walked through. It could be because they were dealing with death. They, they had to, to struggle through uh, those that, that were dying or they could deal with the sexual immorality and their, their brothers and sisters who are falling into that. But we as Christians, as a church, we need to rejoice with those that rejoice and weep with those that weep. But through it all, we need to be speaking the gospel to one another. My counseling, a lot of times when I sit with people, it is literally me telling Christians who have been Christians for a long period of time something that they already know or, or telling them something that they've forgotten. I'm not giving them new information. I'm directing them back to scripture. And so encouraging literally means to speak alongside. And you do so so you can bring comfort and consolation. So you you are not speaking at, you're actually bringing them along. And we could speak the security of salvation, that God loves them eternally, that God will sovereignly fulfill his will for their life, and then these truths will bring joy. The third group is the weak. We as Christians, as a church, are supposed to help the weak. This could seem like the spiritually weak, but that would go to encourage the faint-hearted. This, I believe, is actually talking about the physically weak. And this is one of the easiest ways for us as a church to be the church, is when we see that there is issues or struggles that people are dealing with on a physical basis, that we come alongside and help them as a church. We may be blinded to that. And so I pray that God will open your eyes to how you can help people physically. So we should bear one another's burdens physically and spiritually. And it's actually one of the easiest and tangible ways to do it. So at the end of verse 14, it says, be patient with them all. Be patient with who? The disobedient, the spiritually struggling, and the physically struggling. I have uh, four, five kids. I forgot I had one. Um, I have... <laughs> I have five kids, um, but I, you know, last time I spoke, we talked about how good of a parent we, my wife and I were. Uh, we dropped our kid only three times uh, the first time. And the same kid, Adelina, uh, was in kindergarten. And so we, we would sit down and listen to her. Now, first of all, I don't enjoy sitting down with little ones and helping them read. I don't know if anyone loves doing that. Maybe you, you teachers, you kindergarten teachers, and bless you. Um, but my wife one time tasked me with sitting down and helping my daughter read. At this time, I'm like, I don't think she can read at all. Come to find out she can read just a little bit. She at least knew her alphabet. And so she's, she's sounding out a word. And I, I specifically remember the word have. And she is sounding it out, uh, have. I was like, nope, do again. Have, no, have. It's have. It's just have, kid. This is like the 17th time that you've read this. It's have. And the thing is, we often struggle with people who are struggling with things that we are not struggling with or things that we did struggle with that we now don't struggle with anymore. And so we need to make sure that we are coming alongside and helping people as a church. Let's move on. Verse 15, it says, see that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but also seek to do good to one another and to everyone. So I, I've given the example that I was a lifeguard at camp uh, a few years ago. 
20-some years ago. And when I was lifeguard, one of the things they taught us in lifeguard school is if you go to actually try to save someone that is drowning and you grab them and they start fighting you, any of you been a lifeguard? You're supposed to dunk them and keep them under the water until they stop fighting you. And so we were taught with anyone that, that starts fighting us to actually bring them under because they're panicking. They're not paying attention and they will actually drag you under too. And so we, we were taught to, to make them stop struggling in a very nice way. <laughs> but Paul here, he's saying, see that no one repays anyone evil for evil. And so what's your response oftentimes when someone fights you and wants to help, that you, you are trying to help and they don't want your help? They don't like the truth that you're saying or they don't like uh, what, what you're trying to give them. They lash out at you, right? And then what's your response? You lash back out at them. So as, as you know, it, it was easy as a lifeguard when I'm training to, to gently take the person that's pretending to struggle and put them under, okay? But the person that is actually struggling, when you're going there and you're, you're like in this life or death situation in the middle of a 10-acre lake and they're, they're, they're floundering, you're like, get under. I mean, but, but we are called not to repay evil for evil, but instead seek to do good to one another and to everyone. So we need to react in a way that is godly, that the Spirit would enable us to do. So we've walked through how Paul addresses the relationship of the congregation to its leaders. We've walked through how uh, individually one another are supposed to love each other as a congregation. And then we need to spend some time about how the congregation is in relationship with actually being together corporately. So as a gospel community, we are to worship together. First, respect. Second, love. Third, worship. This is found in verse 16 to 18. We as Christians, we are to grow spiritually as we increase increasingly attain to Christ-like holiness and maturity. And Christians today, unfortunately, our faith tends to reside in the background. We often don't think about the Bible on a regular basis. We don't think about God and our, our spiritual condition. And, and we very little draw on the power of godliness that is available to us in Christ. A lot of times we utilize uh, we have comfort because we can utilize God as a 911 operator to dial into heaven when we're struggling, when we are sick, when we're going through a job loss, when our family is, is, is uh, fighting and, and we go through the times that we, we have issues and we call and say, we need something. But instead, the essence of salvation is knowing God in a personal relationship that grows continually this life until in eternity to come, we have been filled with all of the fullness of God. Ephesians 3, 16 to 19, <coughs> it says that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts with faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love, catch this, may, be strength, uh, may have strength to comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all of the fullness of God. And then Paul moves on from this to give us three very terse commandments. They lack context and probably because he is just with them and he has told them how they are supposed to enact or be used, but he, he is saying this is stuff that is supposed to last in a corporate fashion. So what is that? Verse 16, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. When I read this, I was like, this is how we as a Christian are supposed to act individually. But when Paul is talking, it is actually the church. 
It is how we are to cor- worship, cor- corporately worship together. And so it's like adding y'alls and you alls in front of it. It's like y'all rejoice always and make sure that you all are praying without ceasing. Oh, and you all need to th- give thanks in all circumstances because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for all of you. And so what happens corporately flows to our individual lives. The first one, rejoice always. This is not a giddy uh, session. This is not a, a fit of laughter. This is not just something that we, we, we enjoy and have this happiness for a short season of time. Instead of it is something that exudes from our relationship with Jesus Christ. It is something that we have even in our hard trials, in our persecutions, just like the church at Thessalonica, or in today when we deal with things uh, from the outside, pressing in on our church. They were experiencing uh, results from, from sinfulness and physical weakness and spiritual weakness. And yet he says, rejoice always because joy can still abound. John Little states, and this is one of my favorite quotes. It says, what is there that our ruined nature needs, which it cannot find in Christ? Atoning blood to cleanse from all sin a righteousness in which not even the eye of the divine holiness can discern a spot or blemish. Subduing, renewing power to form us into the divine image, a teacher to instruct our ignorance, a friend to cheer us, a kindred high spirit, a high priest to intercede for us in the heavenly places and to reconcile us to God, a wise, faithful, gentle, almighty shepherd, to lead us and feed us and guard us through the wilderness into the bright, spacious, ever fresh and unfailing pasture of eternity. Did you catch that? The one that's my favorite part, the righteousness in which not even the eye of the divine holiness can discern a spot or blemish. Christian, this is why we rejoice because of the gospel of Christ. So then pray without ceasing. This is not a drop everything right now and get on your knees and pray command. It is referring to an attitude of your heart. The position that you have because the knowledge you have about the gospel, that you are dependent always on God. So thus, talk with him always. Give thanks in all circumstances. This thankfulness turns away, turns us away from ourselves and onto God. Let me say that again. This thankfulness turns us away from ourselves and onto God. The shorter catechism, it says, what is the chief end of man? It says the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So when you understand the sovereignty of God, it allows you to give thanks even in the hardest of times. But Christian, I, I gotta say, sometimes in the easiest of times, we forget to because we think that we deserve it or we have created it. So you have to give thanks in that time too. So imagine if this kind of worship, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances, it, it, it characterized the way that we worship as a church. Imagine you walking into the doors and you're seeing your friends and you start rejoicing with them and then you pray with them and then you, you give thanks with them and then you, you come in here, you sit down, you listen to the music and you rejoice with the music and you pray uh, because of the, what God has laid on your heart and then you thank God for it and then you listen to this message or the word being preached and you rejoice because of what you're, be, what you're hearing and you pray uh, and then you give thanks, and then you, you give, and you take communion, you sing again, and you walk out, and you rejoice always, you pray without ceasing, you give thanks in all circumstances, and then you go to your work, you go to your house, you spend time with your family, and because what you've done corporately, it trickles down individually, and you rejoice always, you pray without ceasing, you give thanks in all circumstances, Imagine what kind of Christians we would be if our heart was bent towards him all of the time. And Paul's saying, this is how it's done. And then he moves into how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. Verse 19, he says, do not quench the Spirit. We are not to despise the supernatural work of the Spirit and treat it with contempt, 
And the thing is, when we think about the supernatural aspect of, of what Christ has done for us, we think of all of the gifts, the, the tongues, the prophecies, the miracles. But what about faith, love, hope, peace, the stuff that we wouldn't have in our natural man, but yet it has been gifted to us by the Holy Spirit? We're not supposed to push that off and we're not to neglect the spirit, the gifts that we do have. First Timothy 4.14 says, do not neglect the gift you have, which was given to you by prophecy when the council of elders had laid their hands on you and then connect that with 2 Timothy 1.6. For this reason, I remind you to fan the flame of the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of, of hands. And so, Christian, we have a gift that has been given to us by God, and we are to fan that flame. We each have been given this gift. This is talking, remember, this is the corporate body to come together, worshiping together. This is not us standing up on stage saying, okay, God, use my gift so that everyone can see it. It is you to, flam to fan that flame of the Holy Spirit. You to use the gifts that God has given you with each other, within worship, and then individually. And then he particularly focuses on neglecting or rejecting God's revealed word by saying, in verse 20, do not despise prophecies. In other parts of scripture, Paul occasionally mentions New Testament prophets. The old Puritans, when you read them, uh, they call it preaching prophecy. They would say that the Old Testament prophets were not primarily foretelling the future, but they were forthtelling the word of God. They would hold to the preaching as being a form of prophecy. But then you have Grudem and other good men who would actually hold to prophecy and other gifts continuing today. Even Grudem, though, would hold that if those gifts were used today, they actually had to fall within the guidelines of Scripture. They had to be protected and used appropriately and we need to remember that these early churches did not yet possess the New Testament. And so God provided prophets to declare God's word. And essentially, they were foretelling the gospel before it was written. So along with the command of do not despise prophecies, he makes sure to follow it up with, but test everything and hold fast to that which is good. There's those guidelines. When I left Michigan... Um, in June of 2014, a couple weeks before that, we were having a yard sale and we were selling all of our furniture because we didn't know where we were going to land and so we, we sold as much as we could and everything else we put into storage. But while we were having a yard sale, I was inside the house, my wife was outside and my wife comes in and says, there's a guy here named Elvis and uh, he is wanting to know if you have any theological books. I was like, yeah, yeah, I do, of course. Let's walk over to the church. I was in the parsonage. It was right next door. And so I walk over and I'm like, I have like two to 3,000 books here you can choose from. I don't know if I'm ever gonna use them again because I'm not planning on going back into ministry. And so have at it. And, and so he, we started talking about theology and doctrine and God and the Holy Spirit. And, and we really enjoyed the conversation so much to where it ended up being almost about an hour and a half. And so at the end of that hour and a half, I looked at him and I said, what kind of job do you do that allows a grown man to be yard sailing throughout the day and spend an hour and a half talking about theology? Like, I, I'm, I'm, what do you do? He's like, well, I buy gold and silver. <laughs> I was like, what? Well, I've got, I got silver you can look at. But so then I was like, is this something you can teach me? And he's like, yeah, absolutely. So he taught me how to test metals. And so I would take this jewelry stone, this black flat stone, and I would scrape gold on it or what would, would look like gold. And then I'd have this acid that I'd put onto it. And when I put the acid on this, this area that I scraped, if it shone through the acid, it was real. If it turned black like the stone, it was fake. And I did that with every piece of jewelry I came across because I wanted to make sure what I was buying was real and that I was giving back and not having anything to do with that which was fake. And so that way, when I walked away, I knew that I was secure with what I had. And that's what Paul is saying here. He's saying, test everything. Hold fast to that which is good. Test the good, hand back 
or even fight against that that is not right or good. So either way you go, Paul, he is commanding believers to test, to put it to the measuring stick of the word of God, to make sure that we hold that which is good and it is defined only by the word of God. And once you understand what is being held to or taught and it doesn't measure up, instead of promoting the things of the flesh, like self-worship, malice, greed, sexual indecency, and falsehood, we are then to, in verse 22, abstain from every form of evil. Run away. Have nothing to do with. And so we are to flee from worldliness and sinfulness. And the thing is, when we hear worldliness, we think of anything that is in the world that we use. And it's not... That's not worldliness. Worldliness is anything found in culture that has fallen values, any fallen values found within culture. And so when we understand that there is fallen values that we are going to be coming up against, we need to flee from. And to do this, we must, we must devote ourselves to bi- the Bible, to learn it, to preach it, to teach it, to follow it, and to live it. And if we live according to the spirit, we will be known by the fruit that we bear, found in in verse Galatians, found in Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Christian, are you characterized by that? Are you characterized by the fruit because your root is within the gospel of Christ and himself? Are you known by love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, self-control? So Paul has spent time making sure that the church at Galatians or I don't know why I'm mixing up Thessalonians and Galatians. Church at Thessalonica understood how to function with the gospel community, but he's not calling out a major, major sinfulness or false doctrine. Instead, he is adjusting just minor issues and making sure that they have a very stabilized church. And so in verse 23, he offers a benediction, which we will end our time with here without much explanation. Verse 23, Paul says, Now may the God of peace, the one who gives peace and passes all understanding, the one who is peace, himself sanctify you or make you holy completely or in every way. And may your whole spirit and soul and body, in other words, all of you comprehensibly be kept blameless without blemish. At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, he who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. Let's pray.